Excellent! Hey everyone and welcome to Paul's Hardware. I am very excited about today's video because this is my first ever full-blown how to build a PC tutorial video for my personal YouTube channel. Thank you guys so much for tuning in today. And uh, for starters, this is how to build my personal system, which is right here. It's Socket 2011, that's Intel's enthusiast platform. However, today's instructional video could also easily apply to Intel's mainstream platforms such as Socket 1150 or AMD's platforms as well. I wanted to start with three good reasons why you might consider building your own personal PC. The first is that it's really not that difficult. Most of the things you need to plug in inside this system are keyed so you can only plug them in one way and hopefully this video will help you out as well. The second reason is that it's easy to actually build a purpose-built system for your specific needs. So my needs include video editing, such as what I'm probably doing right now. Also includes some gaming, because I do get that to that every once in a while. So I've built this system with those two specific uses in mind, and uh, that's why I chose a lot of the hardware that I chose. The third reason is that if you build your own system, you're going to have the confidence to go in, make any necessary repairs or upgrades that might come along in the future, just in case a part might happen to fail, or you need to add more storage or more memory or anything like that. So hopefully those reasons will give you guys a good excuse to go out, buy the necessary hardware, and assemble a computer just like this one. Now this video is about just building the desktop computer itself, so if you're using this as a guide, bear in mind that apart from the hardware shown here, you would also still need an operating system to install like Windows 7 or Windows 8, and peripherals like a mouse, keyboard, and monitor to actually use the computer. So here are all of my parts. A CPU is a good place to start. This is a Core i7-4930K, which is one of Intel's enthusiast processors. This means that it is more expensive, but also very powerful, with 6 cores and a lot of bandwidth for PCI express devices and quad channel memory. I got this to help with video editing and rendering. On the top is a silver heat spreader that protects the die underneath and on the bottom are the 2011 gold contacts that you should be very careful not to touch. Since it is an enthusiast CPU, it won't include a heatsink or fan, so to cool it, I have the SwiftTech H220, an all-in-one liquid CPU cooler with a big 240mm copper radiator. This will keep the CPU nice and chilly so I can overclock my unlocked 4930K. The motherboard is very important because it's what everything plugs into. I chose the Gigabyte X79 UP4 because it has all the features I need. It's socket 2011, so it will work with my CPU. It has the X79 chipset, which will also work with my CPU. And as a bonus, it has a nice sleek black and gray color scheme. The case is a Corsair 760T. It will easily fit my ATX motherboard, and it has lots of room for expansion, cable management, and storage drives. And it looks badass. And it has a big side window to show off the finished build. I'll probably end up adding more storage over time, but to start off with I have a 480 gigabyte Seagate 600 series SSD that I will be installing Windows 7 onto, and for mass storage I have two 4 terabyte WD Black series hard drives that I'll be setting up in RAID 1. That means the data will automatically be written to both drives so I have a backup just in case one fails. The memory is a 32 gigabyte G-Skill Ripjaw Z kit, that's four 8 gigabyte sticks, which means I can set them up for quite channel performance. 32 gigabytes is a lot of memory, but it's great to have for video editing, and these are rated to run at 2400 speed, which I'm pretty sure my CPU will be able to handle. The video card is an EVGA GeForce GTX 770 Classified. It is overclocked and has 4 gigabytes of video memory, which will improve performance on my higher resolution 2560 by 1600 monitor, and it can be set up to work with Adobe Premiere to help render video effects. It's not the fastest video card available, but I think it's a great bang for the buck. The power supply is a carryover from my current system. It's an Enermax Platimax 1200 watt unit that is 80 plus platinum rated. The wattage is admittedly overkill for this new build, but the platinum efficiency rating means I'll save on my electric bill. It's also fully modular, although the cables aren't the most aesthetically pleasing in my opinion, but I might resleeve them in a future update. Those are my components, so let's move on to tools and some random accessories that I have. Fortunately, for most builds, you can get by with a standard Phillips head screwdriver. I like a magnetized tip one, so you can do this little trick to help guide screws into their proper screw holes. Of course, I have a bunch of other things like zip ties, twist ties, and Velcro straps for cable management, uh, these black Rosewill cable extensions to pretty up the power cables a bit, and thermal paste, of course, some other screwdrivers in various sizes, and my spare bag of screws. 
For some unfathomable reason, most computers can have two types of screw threading. One is based on an imperial standard called UNC 6-32, which I usually call coarse thread, and the other is M3, which is a metric standard, and I usually call that fine thread. It's usually not too difficult to tell which one goes where, but I like to test out the vitally important motherboard standoffs for each case since I've encountered both types. Just grab a screw and a standoff and make sure they play nice together. It is time to start building, so I've cleared my work area and I have a rubber mouse mat to protect the components. Also, be sure to purge yourself of static electricity. If you're like most people and you don't have an anti-static wrist strap, then pull out your power supply first, plug it into the wall, but don't turn it on, and touch the housing every so often while you're building. That will discharge static electricity. I'm going to start by assembling the core components outside of the case just to make sure everything is working, and I'm building on a handy PCB blank with rubber standoffs, but you can use your motherboard box. Just don't build on anything potentially conductive like metal or the motherboard's anti-static bag. After unpacking Packing the CPU, I'm going to carefully open the CPU socket on the motherboard by lifting the two lever arms. First is the one with the U-bend, push down, then out and away from the socket and it will lift up without too much trouble. Then do the same to the lever with the V-shaped bend on the opposite side, lifting it all the way up. Push the U-shaped lever back down onto the motherboard and the lid will pop up a little bit for you. Here you can pop off the black plastic cover. This is an LGA socket, which means the pins that connect with the CPU are on the motherboard side. They are very, very delicate, so be careful while the cover is open. Grab the CPU, remembering to hold it by its edges, and look for the small golden triangle on one corner. There's also a triangle etched into the corner of the socket on the motherboard. Just line those up, and with the gold contacts facing down, lower the CPU onto the socket very, very carefully. There are also four notches on the top and bottom edges of the CPU that will align with the socket. Once it's in, don't push down on it, just give it a very, very light jiggle that will make sure it's settled in the socket. And then close first the socket lid, then the V-shaped lever, and then the U-shaped lever, noting that it might take a bit of pressure to do so. And hooray, the CPU is installed. If you have a stock heatsink fan for your CPU, now would be a good time to actually put it to some good use. I do happen to have one for LGA 2011, so I'm going to install it temporarily for the outside the case parts test. Apply some thermal paste in the form of a small pea-sized blob right at the center of the CPU heat spreader. Line up the four mounting screws on the heatsink fan, lower the heatsink slowly onto the CPU, and let it settle so the thermal paste will spread evenly. Tighten each screw starting with opposite corners a few few turns at a time until they're all snug. Don't forget to plug in the fan too, it connects to the 4-pin CPU fan header. Next is memory. Note that I have 8 long dim slots on the motherboard, 4 on either side of the CPU, and I'll be populating 4 of 8 of these with my G-Skills. But which slots should I use? Well, RTFM to find that information. It turns out it's the 4 gray slots, so tip of the hat to Gigabyte here for the color coding. The memory sticks have a notch in the middle that's just slightly off-center, so make sure you've got it flipped the right way, open the side latches of each dim slot, drop the memory straight in, and then apply firm, even pressure straight down on top of the memory stick, and it should snap into place, closing the latches. Go ahead and do this four times. The video card will be next. It has a long PCI Express connector at the bottom, which also has a notch close to the bracket. This goes into the black PCI Express slot that is closest to the CPU, and the graphics card should drop into place without too much pressure. Try not to bump it though, because there's no bracket to hold it in place at the moment. Now we're ready to connect the power and a monitor. Grab the power supply cables needed here. We'll need the 24-pin main motherboard connector, the 8-pin supplemental CPU power connector, and the two 8-pin PCI Express power connectors for the GTX 770. Remember that there's a latch on one side of each plug that will connect with a catch on the motherboard connector. And also don't mix up those 8 pins. The ones for the graphics cards are 6 plus 2, so line those up first. And then also keep the graphics card supported while plugging in the power. Finally, I'll grab a monitor, plug it into the graphics card, via DVI in this case, and turn on the power supply. But the motherboard doesn't have an on-off button. Shoot. Uh, that's okay. Just locate the front panel connector pins along the bottom edge of the motherboard. Find the two that are labeled as power pins. Here they're the red ones. And short them for just a second by touching them both with the tip of a screwdriver. The system should power on, fans should spin up, and if all is well, we have a successful test boot with some BIOS information appearing on the screen. Don't worry if it tells you that there's no boot device or something like that. We actually don't have a drive attached right now. So at this point, you could actually go ahead and connect up your drives and install Windows, but I'm going to go ahead and build the rest of the system in the case. Disconnect everything from the test setup, but leave the memory installed 
installed as well as the CPU. I'm going to remove the CPU heatsink fan and clean the thermal paste from the CPU heat spreader to prepare for the SwiftTech H220 installation. Clear off your work area, grab the input output shield for your motherboard as well as nine screws that will work with your case standoffs. Bring the case on over, open up the side panels and lift them off and set them aside somewhere safe. Just remember that plexiglass scratch is easier than Kyle with a herpes outbreak. Lay the case on its side and pop in the input output shield labels out and make sure that all four corners are seated. If it gives you any trouble, go ahead and give it a push with the butt of your screwdriver. Um, that will usually help pop it into place. Before you drop in the motherboard, make sure that all the cables are pushed aside and that you have all of your standoffs in place. The nine that I need came pre and installed in the 760T, but double check because a standoff in the wrong place or no standoffs at all could cause real damage. The nine screws that you use to secure the motherboard should be snug but not too tight, and that with that, we are one step closer. I like to plug in all my front panel connectors at this point while the case isn't too crowded. This will enable the power and reset buttons, lights for power and drive activity, mic and headphone jacks, and the two USB 2.0 and USB 3.0 ports on the front of the case. The connection points for these are mostly along the bottom edge of the motherboard and labeled on the board as well as in the manual. These connectors are keyed, so for instance, even though USB 2.0 and HD audio are the same size, they can't necessarily be swapped. The 20 pin USB 3.0 plug is along the right side of the motherboard and the individual per pin plugs for the power, reset, and other front panel items can be a real pain to work with, uh, so reference the manual. And remember, you only have to worry about positive and negative markings with the LED D plugs, not the power and reset. Hopefully you'll only have to do this part once. About this time, you can also plug in your case fans to the four pin headers that aren't labeled CPU fan. I am skipping the case's built-in fan controller in favor of direct connection to the motherboard. I'll also be using the fan power splitter provided with the H220, and I will tie up excess cables next to the fan or tucked back behind the motherboard tray. I'm gonna connect up the black eight pin CPU power extension now because next up is gonna be CPU cooler installation and the rad from the CPU cooler could potentially block access to that plug. I'll begin with the radiator on top of the case. I've already swapped in my Gentle Typhoon fans. I've set it to push or send air up through the radiator, and I will just hold the assembly from beneath and line up the eight screws on top. After getting a few in the radiator, it can support itself, and then I can finish off the rest. In a lot of cases, I would need to worry about a back plate on the motherboard for installing the CPU water block and pump, but thankfully with Intel's enthusiast platform, there is one built in. I'll just be using the same principles from the stock heat sink fan installation earlier, a small piece sized blob of thermal paste in the middle, lower the block on to spread the thermal paste evenly, start by getting one corner screw threaded, then move to the opposite corner, then tighten each one a few turns at a time in rotation. I'm going to plug in my 24 pin main power extension and get it routed behind the motherboard. And now, the power supply. It sits at the bottom of the case and I will point the fan down since there is an intake and a filter right below it, and it's secured to the back with four rough thread screws. The motherboard power cables that are already connected can be fed back behind the motherboard tray and plugged into their respective extensions that I already installed. And start to think now a little bit about what cables are still needed so you can plan out your cable management. The cables I still need to install are three serial ATA data cables for the three drives and peripheral power cables uh, with some SATA power and four pin Molex connectors and that's for the three drives as well, as well as the fan hub. I'll install the WD hard drives with these drive trays. They just snap around each side. Just make sure the four plugs are set and the drive connector should be on the opposite side of the thumb grips. Slide them onto the drive rails and I left a spot between them since they can get warm while they're in use and connect a SATA data cable and a SATA power cable to each one. The plugs are L-shaped, so don't flip them the wrong way, and then run the power cable over to your power supply, and the other ends of the data cables will go to the SATA ports on the motherboard. The manual will reveal, once again, which plugs work best. The native X79 ports are fastest, but the white ones here are six gigabits per second and should be reserved for the SSD. The black ports are three gigabits per second, but also native on the X79 controller. They'll work just fine for the two four terabyte WD drives. After sliding the SSD into place and connecting it up with power and data as well, I can move on to the video card. It will be going in the top motherboard slot and it will need two rear brackets removed to make room for the video outs. Feel free to use a screwdriver on these thumb screws, they can be over tightened from the factory. Remove the brackets and then line up the video card to slot in just like in the test build. 
This time you'll be able to secure it properly with the two thumb screws that you just removed, and then move on to connecting the last two power extensions for the eight pin connectors on the video card. Feed these back behind the motherboard tray, wire them up to the power supply with the cables that we used in the test build, and then try your hand at uh, organizing the cables as best you can. I will be using twist ties, Velcro straps, zip ties, and any combination, and just make sure that you minimize the overlap, particularly with thicker cables like the main motherboard power connector, and you should be able to put the right side panel back on without too much unsightly bulging. Unless unsightly bulging is your thing, then go for it. And you're now finished with the build. Just plug in that AC power, flip the switch, and hit the power button. The fans will spin suddenly and the system will burst to life. LEDs shining forth radiantly to light the path to hour upon hour of browsing through cat pictures and the funny subreddit. The memory only just starting to remember for the first time. The hard drives are vast catacombs waiting to store backups of every half-blurry photograph you take of your dog or your sashimi combo. And the graphics card hungers for pixels. Pixels to devour a ceaseless bloody rampage with the echoing screams of the vanquished serenading their descent into hell. Sorry about that. Right, the uh, computer is all finished. I'm happy to say it's been running great for me. I've been using it to do uh, some Assassin's Creed Black Flag gameplay, trying to finish that one off. For you folks at home, the next step would be to install your operating system. I have a Windows 8 clean install guide that you can check out on my YouTube channel. I'll link that so you guys can check it out and move on to the next step. That will also easily apply to Windows 7 if you're installing that operating system. Um, I'm also going to be doing some upgrades to this system in the future, so I'll be sure to do some video content covering that. I've also got more build guides planned. I have an HTPC upgrade update coming very, very soon. So don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel so you can be appraised of all those videos once they become available. Don't forget to like this video because hopefully it has helped you out in your PC building adventures. And uh, I also spent a fair amount of time on it. So your likes are very, very much appreciated and they help me out a lot. Thank you guys so much for watching. Once again, we'll see you all next time. Pixels to devour and cease this bloody rampage. Pixels. Pixels to devour and cease this bloody rampage with the echoing screams of the vanquished serenading their descent into hell. Pixels. Pixels to devour and cease this bloody rampage with the echoing screams of the vanquished serenading their descent into hell. Pixels. Pixels to devour and cease this bloody rampage with the echoing screams of the vanquished serenading their descent into hell.